Welcome everybody to another installment of very entertaining videos. And we'd like to finish up metabolism today. We've been talking about, you know, the big picture with carbon oxidation and we've gone through glycolysis and beta oxidation of fats and Krebs cycle and how all of these things contribute to carbon oxidation and the whole purpose, you know, we made a few ATP along the way, but the whole purpose was to strip electrons off of carbon. And now we've got these electrons and we've got to figure out what to do with it. So where are those electrons? Remember, they're loaded onto molecules like NADH or FADH2. And as coenzymes, these molecules act as taxi cabs, right? Where looking at NADH, for example, it flips back and forth between NADH and NAD+. One being the reduced form, NADH, and the other being the oxidized form. And the difference, fundamentally, is the presence or absence of two electrons carried by a hydrogen ion, really. So, so the easiest way to think about it simply is this one has an extra hydrogen hydride ion, two electrons, and that really constitutes a covalent bond. But it's those electrons that we're after. And I'd like to discuss that just briefly, really quick. The idea is electrons in and of themselves are just electrons, but when they flow, we can do work with them. So let's consider a battery, right? This might be a double A battery where we've got a, a positive end and we have a negative end. And these batteries, if you look, they are 1.2 volt batteries. That voltage is the same thing as potential, right? We measured, we measure membrane potential as minus 70 millivolts in, in a neuron. And the idea is that with separation of charge, positives on one end, negatives on the other end, how badly do these charges want to equilibrate? And for a battery, how badly does the electron want to go from one end to the other? And that's the idea of potential. That's the idea of voltage. The point is this. As we get electron flow, as we complete the circuit, and I get that electricity doesn't work exactly like this, but it's okay to start thinking about it this way. As we get that electron flow and complete the circuit, we can do work. Everything that we have around us, all of our electronics, from computers to phones to you know, televisions, whatever it is, the lights in the room, it's all driven by essentially the flow of electrons. And that's what we want to do. We want to take the electrons loaded up on NADH and FADH2, specifically right there on that hydride ion, and we want to use those electrons to create energy. And we do it by taking the potential energy in an electron and converting it to kinetic energy or energy of movement. Now, the easiest way to think of that is to build a slide. This helps us easily understand the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. Imagine... Imagine a large child up here. They're right at the top. They've climbed up there. The child at rest has a lot of potential energy. Give the child a push, and now the child's going to go downhill. That is the transformation of potential energy to kinetic energy. Exam Consider the example of maybe being able to measure as some sort of scale down here at the bottom, and I'm able to measure the force of the impact that that child has. The higher up the child is on the slide, the more force they're gonna have at the bottom. If the child only starts, you know, say halfway up in here, then the force with which they hit that target at the bottom is gonna be a lot less. But this is the idea of converting potential energy to kinetic energy, energy of motion. And we're gonna see that in the electron transport chain. So before we get to the electron transport chain, I want to first quick just give us a fundamental idea of where this stuff is happening. So let's draw mitochondria. We see the inner membrane, the outer membrane, the intermembrane space between the two membranes, and of course the matrix in the middle. That's where the Krebs cycle, beta oxidation of fats, that's all happening in the matrix. Right now what we want to do is we want to take advantage of the compartmentalization of these membranes by utilizing the intramembrane space. Specifically, I want to present the idea of a gradient, a chemical gradient, where we have lots of stuff in here, 
And as we've learned over the semester, we understand that with a chemical gradient or an electrochemical gradient, if we increase permeability, we can use this gradient to do work. That's the idea. Another example of this would be, for example, think of a hydroelectric dam where I built this dam and behind it, I filled it up, right? I've got this reservoir, this massive amount of water. The water behind the dam represents a massive source of potential energy. For a hydroelectric dam, all we have to do is open up a spillway, open up a door, and that water will start to flow, right? Because that's what water does. Well, now imagine channeling that water through a turbine, forcing the water to turn, just like an old school wheel well, right? Where, where you've got a wheel and the wheel has paddles on it. And as you bring that water over and allow that water to fall, the water hits those paddles and the force of the water falling causes the wheel to turn, right? We're, we're transforming potential energy into kinetic energy. And we're going to see both of these examples in how the mitochondria actually functions. So now let's get into the nitty gritty. Now that we kind of have a baseline understanding of, of energy and what we're looking for, what we want to do now, let's go in right here and let's zoom in and see what that part of the inner membrane looks like. All right, let's quick orient ourselves. On the outside, we have the intermembrane space. On the inside, we have the matrix. And as we've discussed, as we've discussed previously, this is where we're making a lot of NADH and FADH2 through beta oxidation and through the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle. As these are shuttles, right, they've picked up electrons from carbon oxidation, and now they're bringing these electrons to the electron transport chain. So let's list our players in the electron transport chain. Complex 1, easy enough to remember that they're named numbers. Complex 2 complex three, and complex four. And we don't need to worry about the details of how these complexes are made or, or exactly how they function. But I do want to highlight the point that complexes one, three, and four are all proton pumps. Now let's give an idea of how this might work. So in comes NADH. NADH is going to reduce complex one by dropping off its electrons and itself is going to be oxidized back to NAD+. Remember, these are two electrons that were dropped off. We're not dealing with hydride ion anymore. We're actually dealing with the electrons. And I like to draw them up here because this really represents the top of the slide. I'm thinking about this in terms of, of potential energy. And these are high-energy electrons. Now, we mentioned these are proton pumps. Of course, we're in water, and so protons, we're talking about H+, right? H plus is fairly ubiquitous because we're in water. As H plus is positive and protons are negative, we play a little game of cat and mouse where the protons are attracted to the electrons. And so these protons will follow and pop out the other side, trying to get a hold of the electrons. Of course, the electrons never let them catch up. These electrons pop out and are carried by coenzyme Q. In coenzyme Q, deposits the electrons in complex three. I draw the electrons down a little bit because we're going down the slide, right? For every movement the electrons make, they have to go to something that wants them a little bit more. And so they're losing potential energy. Complex three, of course, is gonna do the same thing. Complex three is gonna take them and use those electrons to pump more protons. Those electrons are then transported by a carrier called cytochrome C into complex four, and now they're at the bottom of the slide, but not before complex four uses those electrons to pump more protons. In fact, we can give numbers to this. For complex one, per two electrons from that one NADH, we pump four protons. Complex three, also four protons. And then with what little energy we have, we pump two more protons at complex four. So for those two electrons carried by that one NADH, we're able to pump a total of 10 protons across the intermembrane or the inner membrane into the intermembrane space. We're building the potential energy of a proton gradient. 
To be sure, we haven't made any ATP yet. I get that's our ultimate goal. But right now, I want you to recognize the energy of the electrons is being used to run pumps, proton pumps. And we're pumping protons to create a gradient in the intermembrane space. Now, you might be asking, what about complex two? We completely bypassed that. Well, that's where FADH2 comes into play. FADH2 is also carrying two electrons, but these electrons don't quite have the same potential energy as the electrons carried by NADH. So complex two is the docking site for FADH2. In comes FADH2, it reduces complex two, is oxidized back to FAD, where it can go pick up more electrons. And these electrons that are dropped off come in the slide halfway. These are also taken by Q, same enzyme here, and transported into complex 3. The difference is complex 2 is not a pump, so we don't pump protons with complex 2, but we do pump protons with complex 3 and then complex 4. So now we see the difference between NADH and FADH2, where NADH pumps a total of 10 protons, whereas FADH2 contributes only six protons to the gradient. And therein lies the difference between those two molecules. But now finally, let's turn around and make some energy, right? This is what we've been waiting for. We've got to figure out how to make ATP from this. And that comes as we convert the potential energy of the proton gradient into rotational kinetic energy. So I want you to appreciate this, right? The kinetic energy of electron flow contributed to a proton gradient, which represents potential energy, which now I'm going to convert into rotational kinetic energy with ATP synthase. So ATP synthase looks something like this, where it's got this big transmembrane area that kind of acts as a big rotor, and then it's got this shaft that sticks out and, and, and points kind of downward. And in a very real way, you can watch this in a microscope, we know that these protons want to go back into the matrix, right? There's lots of protons in the intermembrane space. All of these positive charges up here, not only do they repel each other, but they're also attracted to the negative left behind in the matrix, where we have both a strong chemical gradient and a strong electrical gradient. These protons really want to get back into the matrix. And we say, fine, we'll let you go. But the only door we're going to open is this ATP synthase. So, in pops a positive charge. Well, this positive is actually repulsed by other positives, right? If we have a positive sitting right here, for example, and it tries to get away, so it moves in that direction. And that movement causes this shaft to rotate. Now, that's pretty cool because as this shaft rotates, the arm down here it's binding to two things. It's binding to ADP and it's binding to inorganic phosphate. These two things come in and bind to this arm. And as this arm rotates around, I mean, they don't physically bind to the arm, but you can appreciate as this arm rotates around, it's going to grab that ADP and it's going to grab that inorganic phosphate and it's going to squeeze them together. It's going to force them together. This is the idea of oxidative phosphorylation. And this is the idea of creating ATP by physically forcing ADP and PI to come together. It roughly takes about three protons to generate one ATP. And so with the 10 protons that we pumped, we can make three to four ATP for, for the electrons from NADH. For FADH2, we're down kind of by like two ATP, right? So there's, there's a difference in how many ATP are made based on the strength of the proton gradient. And that proton gradient is created by, by these electrons. So hopefully now we kind of have a really good idea of where ATP synthesis is happening in the mitochondria and how electrons, which create the proton gradient, are used in that process. There's one last thing we have to mention, and this is absolutely critical to the entire process. We still have these two electrons right here sitting at the bottom of complex four, and we have a problem. Nobody wants these electrons. They've gone down the slide. They're sitting on the bottom of the slide, but there's no energy left in the electrons. They're stuck. 
Remember, in order for electrons to move, I have to pass them off to something that wants them more than the previous thing. And right now, nobody wants them anymore. This is where oxygen comes into play. This is the very reason you breathe. Oxygen, because it's so electronegative, is the only thing desperate enough to pick up these two spent electrons. So in comes oxygen gas. Complex 4 takes that oxygen, adds the two electrons in the form of a covalent bond, and we generate water, H2O. You can kind of appreciate how this works, right? Oxygen gas, double bonded. If we split each one of these, now to each one of them, all we have to do is add two electrons in the form of a covalent bond there. We'll put another one there. And then there's plenty of H plus around to finish this process. I've just created water. We don't care too much about the water. We're 66% water anyway, so we have plenty around. The point is, I needed oxygen to remove those electrons. Nothing else will. Without oxygen, those electrons stay there, which means this whole slide is backlogged, which means NADH can't drop off its electrons, or FADH2 can't drop off its electrons. Now we can't recycle back to FAD and NAD+. And without that, all the reactions inside the mitochondria, the Krebs cycle, pyruvate oxidation, beta oxidation of fats, all of those shut down because they require NAD plus and FAD for the reactions to occur. That's why all of the processes that we've talked about here are aerobic. We need oxygen to be the terminal electron acceptor. So in summary, metabolism is the story of carbon oxidation, which means I'm stripping electrons off of carbon. Through that process, whether it's glycolysis, or beta oxidation of fats, and then the Krebs cycle, I'm stripping electrons off of carbon. Once carbon is fully oxidized, it's carbon dioxide. We breathe it out. Those electrons are stored on molecules NADH and FADH2. These are my electron taxi cabs. Those taxi cabs bring the electron to the electron transport chain, where the electrons are dropped off, and flow through the electron transport chain from complex one to complex three to complex four. The flow of that electrons runs proton pumps, which then take protons, H plus, and pump these hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space. This creates a strong electrochemical gradient of protons. With the potential energy of that gradient, we let protons through, through ATP synthase, which uses the protons to rotate like a big machine, and the rotation of ATP synthase grabs ADP and inorganic phosphate and smashes them together to create ATP in the process we call oxidative, excuse me, oxidative phosphorylation.